Good, Good evening. I'm glad to have each of you here this evening. And we are going to be exploring health and happiness through this weekend. And uh, I'm excited about the things that we get to share while we are here. And the, the topic ultimately is wellness. Uh, behind me, there's some banners. Uh, they're spelling a, an acronym called New Start. And New Start stands for nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. And these are factors that are necessary in order for individuals to maintain health. But sometimes we're unhealthy and we need to gain health as well. And so these are factors that are actually involved in the regaining of health. I am the president and medical director of Uchi Pines Institute. And Uchi Pines, is, we operate a lifestyle center been around since 1970, so 47 years, and it was started by Drs. Agatha and Calvin Thrash. She was a pathologist, he was an internal medicine specialist from Columbus, and they very early on get, got a vision of changing lifestyles and using that as a means of treating disease and their exploration of various different uh, natural remedies and lifestyle factors uh, led to the development of the Institute and the Institute has trained many individuals through the years that have gone on to various different locations in the world to continue on the same type of work of helping individuals and educating them. And we are going to be talking about some of those lifestyle factors Part of what we're going to be talking about today, Drs. Calvin and Agatha never talked about when they were earlier on in their career. Why? Because we didn't have the research. And um, the, the studies were just not there. And tonight we are going to be looking at this topic called changing genes through lifestyle. Changing genes through lifestyle. Now, these two mice that you see on the screen are drastically different in appearance and function. The mouth, mouse on the left is called an agouti mouse, and it's called an agouti mouse because it contains a gene called the agouti gene. And the, this gene causes the mouse to be yellow, it causes it to be obese, and it causes it to be prone to diabetes and cancer. And <clears throat> the mouse on the right has a normal coat. It's not obese. It doesn't, it is not prone to cancer and it's not prone to diabetes. But the mouse on the right has the very same agouti gene. Right? It has the very same gene. The two are genetically identical. So why are they so different from each other? Well, we know that DNA is the molecule of heredity. It it's, it's transmits information from one generation to the future generation in the form of this giant molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. And, and it can, contains individual units, letters, called nucleotides, which make up the language of genetics. And, and in order to reproduce information accurately, from generation to generation, we're dependent upon this intact DNA code. And it's just like there's a book. You have a book that conveys information, a story. Maybe it's a book that conveys instructions. And its reader is the, the information and the story that they get is dependent upon the accuracy of the information that is conveyed in the book. And so that information includes the letters. The letters, of course, make up the words. The words make up the sentences. The sentences, the paragraphs, and the chapters of the book. And if you mess that up, there's problems. 
Now this is a typical page, I don't expect you to read it, um, but it's a typical page with a typical number of letters on that page. Now if you take your DNA molecule, just one DNA molecule in one cell of your body, and you put the letters that are contained in that DNA molecule on a page like this, and then you add the next page to it, and the next page to it, and the next page to it, until you've gone through all of the letters that are in the DNA that's in one cell of your body, you will have a stack of papers 300 feet tall. That's pretty amazing. Right? 300 foot tall stack of papers, all containing these letters that you have in the DNA molecule. It contains about three billion of these letters, and so it, it conveys lots of information. But one of the other amazing things about this is that the, that information is packed into each nucleus. There's the small little nucleus on the inside of the cell, and that nucleus, if you go to a ruler, a, a meter one, not a U.S. one, a, <laughs> international one that's a meter long. If you go to that ruler and you cut that meter into 10, then you have 10 pieces, then you have a decimeter, right? And you cut that into 10, you have a centimeter. You cut that into 10, you have a millimeter. And you get a really sharp knife. And you get that one little millimeter. And you cut that little millimeter into a thousand pieces. A thousand little pieces. Each one of those little pieces is what's called a micron, and the nucleus inside the cell is a micron in, in size, from one side to the other. So one thousandth of a millimeter, and you pack all of that information inside of it. It's amazing. If you get these letters, and you mess up their sequence, you're going to have problems. So you can understand it's time to dream. Right? Some of us, it might be late. Others, it doesn't seem so late, right? Um, for the little ones, it might be getting closer to time to dream. But if you mess that up and you substitute a, a letter, uh, well, it might be tame to dream. Well, what are you going to tame in order to dream? It changes the meaning of the, of the word. And you might reverse it. And so it's emit to dream, OK? What does that mean? Or you might delete something out of there, so it's tetodrem. <laughs> yeah, okay, it doesn't make much sense. Or you can insert an extra letter in there, and, and so you've got tim et odrim. Right? So there's various different ways that it can get messed up in that, in that language, and it's the same thing in the DNA language as well. It can get messed up. Now, Genes. What are genes? Genes are sections of DNA that contain the code that's necessary to make proteins. And proteins are responsible for the structure and the function of the cells. And so if you have the proper proteins, then you'll have the proper function for the cells in order for them to work the way that they're, work they're supposed to. But if it, doesn't, if it isn't made the way that it's supposed to, then it's not going to function the way that it's supposed to. And one of the examples of that is sickle cell disease. Anybody, you know anybody that has sickle cell? Some, some do, all right. I've treated individuals with sickle cell disease. So what happens in sickle cell disease? In sickle cell disease, the whole disease is the result of the change of one letter in the DNA code. Right. One letter. You, that one letter changes one amino acid that's used in making the hemoglobin molecule. And if you remember back to biology, hemoglobin is the, is the molecule that helps to hold oxygen inside the red blood cells and makes the blood red. Well, when you have the change of one letter in the DNA, which results in the change of one amino acid in the hemoglobin molecule, under times of stress, low oxygen, sickness, other types of things like that, then that hemoglobin molecule doesn't stay together in the same shape that it had before. 
and it starts forming a sickle shape of the cell. And you can see that over on the right. You have that sickle shape of the cell. Now your blood vessels, they get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go away from the heart. And eventually they get so small that a usual blood vessel with this nice disc shape, it has to bend itself and squish through the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels. When it's in the shape of a sickle, it gets caught. It's now too big and it can't get through. Uh, well, if it does get through, it has to break in order to go through. And so individuals that have sickle cell crises, what happens is you start, you start getting this sickle shape. Those get caught in the small little blood vessels. They either break or they don't break and they block up the blood flow and you don't get any blood flow down from there. And individuals have, they have pain. They've got swelling. They've got tissue and organ damage and sometimes they die from the sickle disease. And that's just because of a change of one letter in the DNA. So it's important to have an intact DNA. Right? And we know much of the physical characteristics of a person is determined by their genetic code that they possess. And we also know that many of the diseases which we suffer have a genetic foundation. With that thought in mind, let's go back to the mice. The agouti mice, all right? So both the mouse on the left and the mouse on the right have the agouti gene. But only the mouse on the left is expressing it. Only that one has the, the results associated with the agouti gene, the, the obesity, the diabetes, the cancer, and that yellow coat. So how is it that the mouse on the right has the gene, but it avoids having the problems associated with the gene? Hmm. Well, if you're saying to yourself, there has to be something that is above the DNA that controls how it's expressed, then you're a very smart person, right? Because that's exactly what's happening. Here we have these agouti mice, and in a study that was published in 2003, the research just took genetically identical female yellow agouti mice, and they fed one group of them a normal mouse diet. Don't ask me what that was, they didn't delineate. But anyways, a normal healthy mouse diet. And in the other group, they fed them a normal mouse diet, but they supplemented it with B12, with folate, which is B9, with choline, and betaine. And all of these are substances that are known to add something to the body, and it's called methyl groups. And a methyl group is simply a carbon with three hydrogen atoms attached to it. That's what a methyl group is. See, these are methylators. And so they fed these two different diets to the rat mothers, to the mice mothers, sorry. And what they found is that the mothers that they fed the regular rat diet to, or the regular mouse diet, I should say, um, they had normal agouti gene expression, yellow coats, cancer, diabetes, early death, and so on. But those that they fed the other diet to, supplemented with the B vitamins and the choline and the betaine, a significant portion of the pups born to the mothers had normal mouse-like traits. Brownish gray coats, didn't, they weren't prone to obesity, they weren't prone to diabetes, and they weren't prone to cancer. And so it's almost as if the diet turned off the gene. Hmm. Well, the scientific community, they've, used, they've, they've been arguing for a long time, although it's changing now, that everything about us, like our appearance, intelligence, preferences, diseases, and so on, are, are all dependent upon this DNA code, the letters and the sequence of the letters that are in the DNA. And if we can only just sequence this code, and of course we've done that, right? If you could only sequence this code, we could figure everything out. Well, the agouti mice present a problem with this theory. And you and I actually present a problem to this as well. Why? Well, you have hair and a scalp and brain and eyes and nose and ears and lips and tongue and heart and lungs and stomach and liver and bones and spleen and bladder and fingers and toes and skin. And every cell of your body has the same DNA. And so if it's just the 
code of the DNA that determines what the cell becomes like, how can you have all of these different tissue types but have the same book conveying the same information to all of the different ones? Right? There has to be something else that's involved in it. Well, we see a problem with queen bees as well. Queen bees, they, they're, they're genetically identical to the workers, but they have functional ovaries, but the workers are sterile. They have a larger abdomen, and the workers have smaller abdomens. They, the, the queens go and they kill rival queens. They go on mating flights, and they have this special piping communication. The, the, the workers don't have any of that, but they're genetically identical. So what's making the difference? <gasps> yummy, yummy royal jelly. You can actually find this in, in health food stores. Uh, royal jelly, it's a, it's a, it's a protein-rich food secreted from the heads of the worker bees. And, and, and when you get a larva, and you have the larva grow up inside this royal jelly, that larva will be a queen bee. Right? She will turn into a queen bee. So it's the nutrition, just like with the agouti mice, that's making the difference. But what is the nutrition doing? Well, DNA can be tagged. You can add tags to the DNA, molecular tags. And one of those molecular tags is what we called about a methyl group. See, it's a little carbon with a few hydrogen atoms attached to it. And if that methyl group is attached to certain regions on the DNA, it turns down or it turns off the expression of those genes. So the, the overall effect of methyl groups adat attaching to the DNA is to turn down or to turn off the genes on which it's attached to. They have promoter regions, which is uh, where the whole molecular complex attaches and goes, okay, this is a gene that we need to, we need to uh, uh, transcribe. So if you have a bunch of these, these uh, methyl groups there, it doesn't do that so much. Another way that genes can be turned on or turned off is by modifying histones. Histones are kind of like wheels or barrels that the DNA wraps itself around. And you can see that here in the picture. You have these, these wheels or barrels, and the DNA comes, and it wraps around a couple times, and it goes and wraps around a couple times, and so on and so forth. Well, those wheels or barrels can be tightly wound up. And when they're tightly wound up, the genes can be hidden, so you don't get access to them. But if they relax and they unwind, then the genes are available so that you can transcribe them and get to them. Well, how do they relax, or how do they tighten up? Well, they have little tails on them, and if you add methyl groups to the tails, they tighten up, and you hide the genes, so you can't transcribe them. But if you add another molecule to it called um, uh, oh, acetyl groups, you have uh, acetyl groups that are added to it, then they allow it to unravel, and they expose the genes so that the genes can be expressed. And finally, you have these small mo molecules called microRNAs that can attach to the DNA at different locations, and they can change whether those genes are transcribed or not. And all three of these molecular tags, methyl groups, acetyl groups, and microRNAs, are, and their effect upon the DNA and its expression constitutes a whole field of science that doctors Calvin and Agatha never knew about, <laughs> called epigenetics. Right. Epigenetics is the study of inherited changes in gene expression not resulting from a change in the DNA sequence, meaning you got the sequence there. You've got the letters and you've got the words and all of that kind of stuff, but the genes just don't express themselves or you can change their expression by doing something above the DNA. In other words, adding these tags to the DNA so it changes how the DNA responds. 
And again, the genome is more than just the DNA. You have all of these tags that are associated with it as well. So you're not just the result of your DNA sequence, you're also the result of your epigenome. You're a result of all of these different tags that happen to it as well. Time Magazine rec recognized the significance of this, this new field of science in, in its January 19, 2010 cover article, uh, Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny. The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. That might be a scary thought. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, so let's take a look a little bit more. Uh, there might be, perhaps, an effect on the children based upon the mother's diet when she's pregnant. Think maybe? Pickles and ice cream might not be the best thing for the baby, even though mommy might be craving that at the time. Right? So there's a study, again, that was done. This time it was with rats. And uh, they were looking at vis different uh, dietary interventions. And, and for one group, they gave them a, a healthy rat diet while the, while the rats were pregnant. And while they were still we um, nursing the pups until they were done with that nursing period, then they gave another group a high-fat diet, and then they had a third group, which was a crossover group, where they gave uh, them a, a high-fat diet, but then after the pups were born, they gave them to moms that had a low-fat, uh, a, a healthy diet. And this went on from day six of embryo development through postnatal day 15. So by, by 15 days after birth, the pups are weaned, and they're foraging on their own, and so on and so forth, right? So what they found, was that the pups that were born to the mothers that had the high fat diet, those pups would eat more food every time they ate. They would prefer high fat foods if they had a choice. They had higher blood lipid levels. They had higher body weight. They went through puberty earlier. By the way, do you know what the average age of puberty was about uh, uh, early to mid-1800s? 17. Yeah. You know what the average age of puberty is now? Yeah, around 11. Right. Um, so we've lost, uh, <clears throat> we've lost six years of childhood over time. And uh, part of it might just be mom's fault. Sorry. Right. And then they had the high fat uh, the group uh, that was then breastfed by, the, by the, the healthy diet mothers. And they had similar uh, types of responses, but a little bit less. And so the researchers wanted to find out what's going on, what's causing these changes. Why is it that, that they are preferring high fat foods? Why are they eating more? Why are they obese? And so on and so forth. And so in the process of investigation, what they found is that when the mother rats were fed this high fat diet, it changed the epigenome, these tags, these molecular tags in the developing fetus's brain, causing cells to develop in a place called the hypothalamus, a region of the brain, and those extra cells increased the levels of chemicals in the brain that led to the rats to eat more food, to prefer high fatty foods, and so on and so forth. And it's interesting because our influence can influence our children's epigenome and it can have impacts throughout their lifetime. Another study was done, and this was in Sweden. In Sweden, there, um, there's a, a, a population, a, a, a village, that's very isolated from many of the other villages. And so if they have crop failure, you can't just go to the next Walmart and buy all that you need, right? Or you can't go to the next village and, and barter and do all that kind of stuff to get food. If the crops fail, you starve. Yeah. And so it's a really good uh, population to look at because now you get to look at whether, you know, what are health results associated with uh, being well fed versus not being so well fed and so on and so forth. Well, they've been collecting information well uh, over about 105 years 
uh, in regards to crops and how well the crops have done each season. And they also collect data from individuals that were born and lived through that and their death and what they died from and so on and so forth. And so they were able to correlate all this information together. And they came and found something very interesting with this study. They were looking at the grandfathers and how much food was available to the grandfathers when they were in their prepubescent time, about 9 to 12 years of age. Why? Because that's um, the, the, uh, the sperm development is going, to be, uh, is going to be beginning around that time, and that's going to have a strong impact during that time about what's going to be then passed on to children and so on and so forth. And so, and so they're looking at that time frame, and what they found was interesting. The grandsons were affected by the grandfathers. And the correlation was this. In the years when there was poor crops, and they had to scrimp, and they had to eat less, and they had to try to make it through, and they were in this prepubescent pre pre age, the grandsons lived longer. But those who had a sufficient supply of crops during the 9 to 12 year age period, the grandsons died sooner and typically from diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And looking at it, they discovered that it was because of epigenetic tags, epigenetic changes to the DNA that was passed on then to the next generation, which was then passed on to the next generation. It wasn't a change in the DNA sequence itself, but it was epigenetic changes that was passed on from generation to generation. And that affected the grandchildren with early death or longer life. So we find that the quantity of food permanently affected the health status of the grandchildren. And <clears throat> the DNA codes didn't change relative to that. So the, the queen bees, it's a nutritional issue. You change the nutrition, you change the outcome. Well, the agouti mice, that's a nutritional issue. You add the, the, the special nutrition to them and they change their expression. Uh, you get the mothers with the high-fat diets, and you change the nutrition, it changed the expression of the genes. And you have the study, the Swedish study, showing that the changes in these lifestyle factors, nutrition factors, we're talking about specifically right now, have a powerful factor in influencing the epigenome and causing genes to be turned on or turned off. In fact, when you look at the epigenetic literature, you find that of physical factors, nutrition is number one in its ability to change gene expression by changing the epigenome. But it's not just nutrition. So what's he doing? Exercise, right, thank you, exercise. All right, we've known for years that, that if you participate in, in, in regular resistance exercise, like weightlifting, th there's a number of health benefits associated with it. Uh, you increase the muscle size and muscle strength, there's less insulin resistance, it helps with diabetes, and so on and so forth, but we didn't really know exactly how the, the changes came about. Well, guess what? Studies now are revealing that when you regularly participate in resistance exercise, the methylation pattern, those little methyl groups and them being added to the DNA, the methylation pattern changes in the DNA. And you can study it beforehand and after exercise, and you can see changes in those methyl groups added to the DNA, which then allows certain genes to be expressed that allow for muscle growth and so on and so forth, and other genes to be suppressed, like genes that help promote insulin resistance. Right? And so you have these changes that ultimately end up in the function or the end result that we know of where it improves diabetes and it helps to increase muscle strength and so on and so forth. 
Well, is there anything else that can impact the epigenome and gene expression? Sure. Rats. All right, so it's another story of rats, all right? And this is a, this is a serious, uh, series of uh, studies that were done. And uh, what they were wanting to do is to see if mother's behavior can affect the children, all right? And so what they did in this particular study is they took some good mothers and they took some bad mothers, right? Did you know that rats had deadbeat mothers? <laughs> all right, it's not all equal on the rat field either, right? Um, so you've got some, you, you have some rat mothers that are, that are very motherly, right? So the good rat mothers, they lick and they groom their pups, they give them extra space to, to suckle and so on, and the bad mothers, well, they, you know, they're, they, they just leave the pups behind and they go wandering and foraging and spend a lot of time away and they don't lick and, and, uh, and caress the pups so much and so on and so forth, right? So there's these behavioral differences that you can see between the two. And, and so what they did is they, they, they took these, these uh, nice mothers, very attentive mothers, right? And, uh, and then they took the inattentive ones. And they raised them and they raised their pups and so on and so forth. And then they wanted to look at the brains and what was going on in the brains of the pups that were born to the, to the, to the nice mothers and the ones that were born to the not so nice, nice mothers. And what they found is that there were significant additions of methyl groups in the brain, in certain regions of the brain, that affected stress hormone receptors. And those pups that had the deadbeat mothers ended up being having a high anxiety patterns throughout their entire lifetime. Now, how can you tell a rat has anxiety? Anybody know? Well, you have open field tests. And an open field test is you put them inside of a, of a container and <clears throat> you, you can have a camera that follows the motion of the mice uh, or the rats and you put them in that container and there's nothing to cover them, there's nothing to hide in. And so it's an open field. And rats will stay along the edge because that's the safest place to be, right? And so they'll, they'll go explore the edges and 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 the ones that are really nervous are ones that really stay by the edges. They're, they're, they're afraid to go out and explore anywhere. The ones that are less nervous are the ones that are more explorative. Yeah, they check the edges, but then they go venture out into the center, and then they go back to the edges, and they go and venture out into the center some more, and then they go out to the edges, and they, they're more exploratory. They're less afraid of that open field and that open environment. So that's how they extrapolate anxiety. But anyway, so rat anxiety changes the, 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 the structure in the brain. Now, interestingly enough, was that because of genes or was it because of the epigenome? Well, you switch the pups now at birth. You've got, you've got the, the inattentive mother's pups and you have them f raised by the attentive mother. And you take the pups from the attentive mother and you have them raised by the inattentive mother. Guess what? You have the same affected pattern, not by the ones who were born to the inattentive mother, but by the ones who were raised by the inattentive mother. Right? You have that increased anxiety. So it's not just because of what happened in the womb, it's because of how mom treated the pups after they were born that made the effect. And the final study that they did, was an interesting one, is <clears throat> after getting these results and you have the, the pups that are born to the inattentive mothers, the deadbeat moms, and they have all of these epigenetic changes that would normally lead to this anxiety pattern through their life, what they did is they injected a substance and in, infused their brains with it called trichostatin A, and this drug can remove methyl groups from the DNA. So it removed the methyl tags, the tags that were added to the DNA from the deadbeat mothering, and guess what the what the rats did not exhibit now through the rest of their life. Anxiety. 
That's right. They did not exhibit the anxiety patterns before. So conclusively through these studies, they show that, okay, well, it's not just the fetal environment, it's the behavioral environment of mother, which adds methyl groups and so on and so forth to the DNA, and you can use a substance to wipe off the methyl groups and the effect goes away. Right? Very interesting. And, uh, and also they found that inattentive mothering uh, affects the babies in such a way that it increases the estrogen receptors and makes them less attentive to their babies too with these changes that happen. Well, so we find that social factors are, 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 that are between the parent and the child and, and are cause significant changes to the epigenome. We haven't thought of it necessarily as an epigenetic issue, but we know social factors affect children, don't we? You know, to grow up in a home where you're abused is much different than to grow up in a home where you're not, right? And the changes are, are, are significant. And the effect of these social relationships, it can be good news or bad news depending on which side of the fence you've been on, right? But is it always permanent and can it never be changed? No. The studies show that the epigenome can be changed even into late life. Right? Yes, things might be, uh, tags might be added, things might be changed, um, and, uh, and there might be effects through the lifetime associated with what parents did or grandparents did. But there's things that you can do in your own life to start changing it around, right? Turning off that effect. Now let's look at another interesting study. This was done by Dean Ornish and his friends in 2008 in California. This pulls a lot of these factors together. So we talked about nutrition, we talked about exercise, we talked about psychosocial factors, right? Now here's not a rat study, this is a people study. Let's get to people. So this is a people study, and what he was doing is he was looking at men who have low-grade prostate cancer. And low-grade prostate cancer, um, it, it's, it's considered okay to do a watch and wait, meaning that you don't have to do the radiation, you don't have to do surgery. You can kind of hang out for a while, watch how things go, monitor, and if it looks like the prostate cancer is progressing, then we do something. Well, instead of just watching and waiting, Dean and his researchers put them on an intervention program. What kind of intervention program? A lifestyle intervention program. And so what they did is they had a three-day intensive residential retreat. So they went to Dean's center, they, the three days, lots of classes and education, and this is how the program's going to work, and this is how you're going to eat, and we're going to have, you know, all of these different things that are going on. And then after three days, they kick them out, out to home, and then that's the outpatient phase. And then every week, a nurse calls them up, asks them questions and how things are going, and so on and so forth. They're involved in stress management classes. They're doing some moderate exercise regularly. They're in psychosocial support groups, but then very importantly is the dietary interventions. And Dean puts them on a very low fat diet, very low fat. 10% of your calories from fat, that's really low. Now just try to do it in your own diet and get down to 10% calories of fat, it's pretty low. There's certain things that you cannot eat and keep it that low. And he put them on a whole foods plant-based diet so no animals, no animal byproducts or anything like that. And they used some additional tofu in there. Uh, Dean's a, fa a fan of fish oil. And there's more research coming out showing that it might not be the best thing. And then there's the mercury and some other um, stuff that's associated with it. And um, flax oil, I think, is probably a better option. Vitamin E, selenium, vitamin C. And guess what? They gave them all of the food for the whole three months just to make sure that people were compliant <laughs> with the program. Now, hmm, I get to get into the study, and it might help me, and they provide all of my food for three months. I don't have any grocery bills. Right? 
that sounds pretty good to me. And I get sexual, uh, psychosocial support and so on and so forth. The only downside is you've got to get a biopsy beforehand and you've got to get a repeat biopsy afterwards because they want to know what's going on in the tissues and what's going on with the prostate and the prostate cancer. And what they found was this. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's like Christmas. Red and green with a little white in between, right? All right, so what is this? 30 participants involved in this study, 30 men with low-grade prostate cancer, and each column that you see here is each different man that's in the study. And so there's 30 columns here, and then you see the little white line in between, and then there's 30 columns on the other side. Well, each column represents a man, and they're in the same order before the study and after the study. Right? So they're in the same, right? And <clears throat> you can see that there's a change in color. What does a color represent? The colors represent protein traffic inside the cells. Now remember, genes code for what? For proteins, right? Genes code for proteins. And so if you have a lot of protein traffic of specific proteins, and that's what the, what the rows are, right? these nice little uh, letters, number combinations, those are different proteins that are known to be associated with prostate cancer. And it's looking at how active those genes are relative to prostate cancer. And dark red means much more activity, and light green means much less activity. And so now, with that information, you look at it and you go, oh, look, there's a bunch of dark red over here, and there's a bunch of green over on the other side. The intervention in just three months of changing the lifestyle and the diet and psychosocial factors and that kind of stuff, it significantly decreased the activity of the cancer-associated genes in the prostate cancer. Now, what implications might that have? Well, you might die of old age before you died of the prostate cancer if the activity of the genes significantly decreased like that. Now, not only was the benefit associated here with the prostate cancer, but they also lost weight, their blood pressure went down, and their cholesterol levels improved significantly. Eh, good stuff. Now, again, I'm the medical director at Uchi Pines Institute, and that's up just north of us in Seal, Alabama. And over the last five years, I've had the privilege of working with hundreds of individuals in helping them to modify their lifestyle, to, to adopt healthy eating patterns, healthy exercise patterns, right? Uh, getting out in that fresh air and sunshine and so on and so forth and using some natural remedies like herbs and water treatments and that kind of stuff and teaching individuals how to live the healthiest way possible within the context of whatever their disease is, right? And at UG Pines, you know, people come for two and a half weeks, 17 day programs, and, and we have the opportunity to teach them. And while we do not ourselves do epigenetic studies, we see the results of changes to the epigenome. Because we have individuals that I run into, because I've only been there for five years, but I run into people and they're like, oh yeah, we went there 22 years ago, and guess what? Oh, I, my doctor gave me a year to live, and I, had, and I had lymphoma. And they didn't have really any treatments for me at the time. And I'm still alive, and there's no lymphoma. Right? And somebody else, you run into them, and they're like, oh, I was there seven years ago, and I had cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And, and there's really no good treatments for that. And, and uh, it took two years, but it finally went away, and I'm doing fine. I ran into somebody else and they were there and they had heart dysrhythmia issues that were going on and very problematic and looking at having to have interventions. And Over the last 10 years, they've only had five episodes that they could count. And they were fairly short and went away pretty quick. You know? And other individuals from that standpoint. It's powerful what happens when you start using these different things that utilize the epigenome to change gene expression. 
Well, Mary came to, to us a few years ago, and she was, she, she was in trouble. She was morbidly obese, and she had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. She was dealing with heart failure at the time. She didn't know it, but she was diabetic. We found that out when she came, doing the blood work. And, and she had a really poor quality of life. She was in such a situation where she had difficulty getting from her living room to the car in the garage. It's an attached garage, not a detached garage, an attached garage. It was difficult for her to get from the living room to the car. And she would be so out of breath, it would take her about five to 10 minutes to catch her breath before she could then drive away. Well, where is she gonna drive to? Well, she was a Christian woman, and so she'd drive to church. But she had to make sure that she left for church an hour early because she had to get the spot next to the front door. Because if she didn't get the spot right next to the front door, she wasn't going to make it to the pew. That was her life. And I had the opportunity of investigating in her case and finding out what was going on. And, you know, she was eating lots of meat. And uh, that's high in cholesterol, right? And that's high in saturated fats. And, and uh, she led a fairly sedentary life. And, and um, you know, exercise was just not a part of the picture. Uh, she was, I mean, the heart failure and all of that kind of stuff. And, and uh, she was not staying well hydrated, right? So she was kind of chronically dehydrated. She was not getting out and getting her sunshine. And, oh, she loved food. Anybody here love food? The question is, does your food love you back? Right? It's okay to love food, but does your food love you back? If you only love it because it's killing you slowly, I'm sorry. You're not doing well. But if it loves you back, good, good. So understanding all that was going on with her, these, these different violations of health, that she was uh, experiencing, what did we do? Well, we stuck her on a plant-based diet. You know, lots of grains, lots of uh, fruits and vegetables and some grains and legumes and, and so on. And, and uh, that gave her a lot of fiber. It was low calorie and low fat. And guess what? When you have a lot of fiber and you've got less fat, you, you start to lose weight. And, and uh, we put her on two meals a day. What are you talking about? Yeah, two meals a day. There's studies that are looking at cancer, uh, colon cancer and rectal cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, and associated with the number of times that you eat per day. And as you increase the number of meals per day, the percentage of your, your risk for colon cancer and rectal cancer increases significantly. So the normal American three times a day has about a 40% increased risk. Uh, for cancer compared to those who are eating two meals or less a day, and those who are eating four meals a day have a 90% increased risk compared to that, and so on. So anyways, we put her on two meals, and, and in dealing with individuals who are diabetics, and we'll get to diabetes tomorrow, a whole, session, a whole, whole, whole hour on diabetes and how to treat it naturally. Anyways, we, we put her on uh, the two meals a day. It really helps with the blood sugars. It really helps with the weight loss. It really helps with a lot of things. And, um, and then we, you know, had her be grateful <laughs> while she was eating. Um, sometimes when you're not used to eating things that aren't so fatty and less salt and so on and so forth, you can have the tendency to grumble a little bit. Uh, but eat with a grateful heart. And uh, we got her involved in a progressive exercise program. You know what that was? It was breakfast. <laughs> it was lunch. Because in our center, her room was farther to the kitchen than it was for her to get from her living room to her car. So just getting the meals was a chore for her. But it was a challenge as well, and she got hungry, and we didn't feed her in her room. So um, she had to go walking. And, and, and eventually, we got to the outdoors fresh air and sunshine for her. Good stuff and lots of water. So her room was the first one down the hall on the left, uh, room one. This is one of the halls. Uh, inside and so she had to walk down the hall and come down the next hall and go down to the kitchen Well one day when she was walking by the kitchen she she went to the front veranda area and and uh, Decided you know, I'm gonna look out the front door Of course you got to walk there. So she did she walked there and she looked out and she said well 
That looks like it's interesting outside. I think I'll go there tomorrow. So the next day she did, and she went out to the veranda, and she sat down on one of the benches there, and she thought, you know what? I think I'm going to just walk under the veranda. So she did a lap under the veranda. And, and a couple days later, she decided, well, maybe I'm going to just, uh, I'll, I'll tackle the, the parking lot. Right? So uh, I'll do a lap, lap around the parking lot. So she did, and then she took a break. And, and the following day, she did a lap around the parking lot and took a break and then did another lap around the parking lot. And after a few more days, she looked at the whole center and she said, all right, you know what? I think I can walk around the center. And so she did. She started walking around the center. And she stayed with us two sessions. Some, sometimes people do. And so she was with us for about six weeks. When she got to around four, four and a half weeks of her time there, this is uh, kind of our campus uh, aerial view. The lifestyle center is up there where the smiley face is. And then we have you know, the road and the farm and all that kind of stuff that we have. And uh, it, so about four, four and a half weeks into her stay, she was walking all the way around there over a mile a day. Oh, wow. And she learned to say no, <laughs> you know, to, to control that appetite a bit, eat for health rather than for taste. And uh, so those health habits were strengthened and she was following more of these laws of health. And over a six week time, she lost 30 pounds. Her blood sugars came back to normal. Her blood pressure was now controlled, no need for medication, and she was getting her life back. She knew that she was going to die soon before she came. And so she put every effort into cooperating however she could. Jackie, she came to us, she was overweight, she was suffering from insomnia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and she had fibromyalgia. And um, her life was just a continual experience of suffering. Now, early in her life, that wasn't the case. She was an exerciser. She slept well. She, uh, you know, she controlled things pretty well, but something happened. You know what happened? She got married. She got married. Right? Her husband was not interested in healthy food. He was not interested in healthy habits. And slowly over time, she drifted and, and, and she paid for it. And so, you know, the diet changed. She started eating like him and adding more animal products to the diet. And, and, and then the exercise started drifting off because she was busy at work and getting overworked. And, and then she was having difficulty sleeping. And then that was messing up everything else. And she was developing these diseases. And life was just miserable. And so Jackie came to us, and just with Mary, just like with Mary, I began to identify the things that weren't working so well, and we started with a nice plant-based diet. Actually, I, we didn't start with a plant-based diet. We started with a fast. Yeah, like three days fast, you know. Fasting is good. There's lots of really good research with fasting and showing the positive benefits. Immune system, three-day fast, 72 hours. Uh, there's resetting of the stem cells in the immune system, uh, implications for autoimmune conditions and, and uh, cancer and so on and so forth. Really good stuff. But anyways, <clears throat> after you haven't eaten for three days, guess how good salad looks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're looking. You're like, oh, yeah, I'll eat that. <laughs> And it's good for you, right? So we had a nice plant-based diet, and we gave her lots of water to drink and got her walking on a regular basis, even though it hurt. We had her push through the pain and, and, and keep walking and, uh, and so on, and, and got her out there in the sunshine and the fresh air, and we did some, some water treatments, some hydrotherapy treatments. We're going to demonstrate a few of those on Sunday, uh, around two-ish or so, and uh, got using some herbal teas, got her on a regular schedule as well, and pointed her to her savior. And so what did she do? Well, you know, sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes uh, there's challenges. So she had difficulties, right? But she trusted in the Lord. She kept going on. She continued doing what she recognized was right. And she lost some weight. It wasn't a whole lot. She was, I think she maybe lost around somewhere between five and 10 pounds. Uh, during the two and a half weeks. And that's not much when it comes to um, weight loss there. But her pain was less. She was feeling uh, much better, really, in regards to her, her pain. Well, I followed up with her about four or five months later, and at that point, she had been strict. She'd been keeping with her new lifestyle, and she, had, she was sleeping like a baby. Like, oh, Doc, I'm 
sleeping so well. It's like all the old days, you know. I, I, I don't have any problems with getting to sleep or staying to sleep. And, 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 and she had no pain. Oh, she was so excited. She, she hadn't had a day free of pain for years and no pain now. And her chronic fatigue was gone. She had lots of energy and she lost 60 pounds in five months. That's pretty good. <clears throat> I don't have time to talk about Ivan. We're running out of time. He came with diabetes and obesity and so on and so forth. And we did all similar types of stuff with him. And he did so much better. He stopped all of his medications. He had medications for diabetes and blood pressure and cholesterol. We stopped all of those. And in one month, his blood sugars came from 173 to 101. His hemoglobin A1C, which is a, a marker of the average blood sugars over the last three months, it came down from 12 to 9.7. Now, 9.7 isn't great, but 12 is horrible. <laughs> and so it's better, you know. And, and uh, his blood pressure, he came, he was 153 over 102. When he left, he was 90 over 70, off meds. And he was on meds when he came. His cholesterol went from 192 to 164, and we took him off his cholesterol medication. Triglycerides went from 158 to 80, which is ideal. The, the HDL, which is his good cholesterol, came up. And his bad cholesterol, the LDL, went down from 124 to 101. And before, he was having difficulty walking. And he got done. And he was, he was uh, working on preparing for a 5K. And uh, yeah, I don't have time for Michelle. Ovarian cancer and uh, the results that she had and so on. Um, beautiful stuff. You, you've got that in your handouts. Uh, Lillian and her lymphoma, um, and uh, the things that were uh, beneficial in her in overcoming her disease. Dave, um, an administrator, uh, came to us in January of this year, and uh, diabetes and heart disease and obesity and so on and so forth. I just talked with, uh, I was actually with Dave at an interview, um, uh, was it a week ago? A week ago. He's lost 53 pounds. His blood sugar levels are right, right down into the normal range. He's doing excellent. He's so happy about life and so on. So many different stories. And there's this fat guy on the left, and he's not so fat on the right. <gasps> what? Oh, yes. You know, you got to have your own personal experience in, you know, in lifestyle change as well. So as we survey the land of research and we, we, we look at the things that impact our health, it appears that lifestyle factors and their impact upon the epigenome have the greatest piece of the pie. Right? Yeah, sure, there's the DNA sequence, there's medical care, there's environment and so on and so forth, but it's really this epigenome and lifestyle that's the big piece of the pie. And so what we find is that changing your diet and lifestyle changes your epigenome, which changes your gene expression, which very literally changes you. But not only that, it changes your children too. So how long can this effect go? How many generations can these epigenetic changes go? Well, we know from the uh, queen bees that it affects the individual, sure. And we know from the agouti mice that it can affect the children. And we know from the, uh, the Swedish study that it can affect the grandchildren. What about the great-grandchildren? Hmm. Well, I'm sure that there's probably studies out there already, but... Um, I come from a, from a Christian background, and so I, I'm going to pop right here to here. Exodus 20, verse 5. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Hey, a lot of people look at that and they go, oh, what a vindictive God that is. Right? You do something wrong, and he's going to take it out on your children and your grandchildren and so on and so forth. No. He's just saying, I know how I made you. I know how you work. You don't know anything about epigenetics several thousand years ago, right? But I know how you function. And if you make these choices, it's going to affect your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And the effect will cease about there, right? And, and so he's giving loving warnings to his children. So what do we find? Well, we find that your your genome, the, the DNA code, hopefully remains fairly stable. 
Yeah, we could get into a whole different discussion and talk about mutations and how many mutations and so on and so forth. Generally, there's this thing called um, genetic entropy, a whole, uh, whole new, again, another area of science, but anyway, genetic entropy, it shows that we accumulate somewhere around, a, around 200 genetic mutations every gene generation. Harmful. Right? Evolution is not helping us out. It's, we're going the other direction right now. Um, so we find that the genetic code remains relatively stable, but the epigenome is very pliable. It can change even through time. And one of the factors that can modify it the most so that you have the best effect associated with it is nutrition. Right. And we didn't talk about this specifically, but but that epigenome is, the, is most able to be influenced when you're a fetus, when you're developing in mother's womb, and then as you're little. But it can still be influenced, and it can still have epigenetic changes even when you're older. So you never, until you're dead, get too old to actually change the epigenome and the effects that are associated with it. And both the chemical and the social environment, right? It's not just what you eat and what you do. It's also how you speak and respond and attitudes and behaviors and so on and so forth, right? Those actually impact the epigenome as well. And thus it impacts gene expression and function. And epigenetic effects are surprisingly specific. Certain genes, and we weren't able to go through some of those studies, but only certain genes go up and other genes go down. It's not like a... a, 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 a a shotgun and you knock everything out. Specific ones go up and specific ones go down. And, and, and environmental exposures can impact disease susceptibility, not just for you, but also for generations to come. And the epigenome is the vehicle through which lifestyle factors and, in, and environment impact gene expression. So why, can, why does lifestyle make a difference? It's because of the epigenome. That's the the method or the, uh, the structure through which the lifestyle factors are making its impact. And these changes occur over a relatively short period of time. It doesn't take many, many, many years to accumulate. It happens very quickly. And we find changes even within days of working with individuals. Right? And while in the past, we had looked at things and said, okay, well, I have this gene, and so that's why I am the way that I am, or I do this, or I do that. What epigenetics is showing now, there's personal responsibility, right? And what we choose to do and what we, what we, um, what we participate in and how we eat and how we exercise and so on and so forth has a very real effect and impact upon the outcomes, right? And it affects yourself. It affects your children. It affects the grandchildren. So uh, make your decisions before you have children to be healthy. But that's not all of our cases. Right? So maybe we're an hour late and a dime short. Right? Yeah, maybe you already dug your hole and now you've got to live in it. Right? Uh, you had all the unhealthy behaviors and and uh, now it's affected your children, and they have, you know, lifelong issues associated with your stuff. Well, God loves you, and he loves your children too, right? And he's able to take your mess-ups and your mistakes and all that kind of stuff, and he's able to turn those into stepping stones to success. And whatever spaghetti noodle you get yourself wrapped up into... And however many knots you have tied into it, he can undo it. Right? He can undo it, and he can untangle it, and he can get you out. And he's not just looking to forgive you. He's, helping you, he's looking to help you overcome. Right? And as we make those changes, as we cooperate with him, and so on and so forth, we develop a new epigenome. And that develops really a new you. So what if you've messed up your children? Well, you've got two weapons. You can pray. Pray for them, right? But you can also give them your own personal example, right? Live a healthy life around them. Don't flaunt it. Don't push it in their face. Don't do all of that kind of stuff. Just live, right? 
And eventually they might get the clue, oh, hang on, like mom and dad are like different. And it's not just a temporary different, they're like really different. And at some point they might come back and go, um, what happened? What are you doing? Like, you, you look good. <laughs> well, that's the time to just tell them what you're doing. Not judgmental way and so on, just tell them what you're doing. One quote, many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you're weak. Immoral power, slavery and doubt and control by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. Hey, ooh, anybody try to make a rope out of sand? Wouldn't work very well, huh? So your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything be depends upon the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, it's theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose. You can choose to serve him. You can choose to give him your will. Right, then he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That's a good thing because I don't do so well. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. It, your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above prince, all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you fast, steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live a new life, even the life of faith. There, there's, there's overcoming power. And it's there for you. And you might have a gene that predisposes you to something, but you have an epigenome. And that epigenome can change. And it can change in response to your lifestyle and the things that you do. Thank you very much.